when we do an interview, it's about what the guest, what's going on with the guest, and that's that's sort of important for us. Mm-hmm. Mm. It, it's funny because sometimes we get fans and comments and feedback and say, "How can you let this fly to get away with saying this or saying that? How can we didn't correct them? How can we didn't disagree with them?" And it's like Dennis said, "We're not here to debate them. This, this is not this is not sort of a two way conversation. We ask questions, and whatever they say is whatever they say." Sometimes we'll give them opportunities to elaborate or clarify things. We're never going to you know, just flat out disagree with what someone says. And as you sort of asked us about where, when it comes to giving our thoughts, I just think that the key really is to be respectful. As long as you word things well and as long as you're not trashing someone for, for the sake of trashing someone, if you can put forward a logical argument, and this is obviously later on in our show when we give our thoughts and it's time to give our opinion, um, mm-hmm. I, think, I think a lot of people understand it. We've never had a situation where a fighter or anyone has, has been frustrated with us or upset at us for, for our opinions, I think, because of that very reason. Mm-hmm. And Jonathan, just quickly, you know, I think one of, the, one of the things I notice sometimes in MMA and other sports is people have this tendency to think that people don't have the ability to have an opinion. Mm-hmm. Well, even if you have a shit opinion, that's your opinion. And it's not up to me and Casper to say, hey, you, you know, you can't think the way you think. And I think there are people out there sometimes and hear interviews, they try and force their opinion on other people. And that's when you get these kind of situations where people can't say what they really feel and there's a huge crisscross of things. So, yeah, I mean, look, we're always, we're always thinking about it. We're always looking through questions, having a think about how it can be neutral. It's, it's difficult to always be neutral, but you always want to try your best to do it. And, um, yeah, just avoid those situations where you force your opinion on listeners. And the best way is when a listener can walk away from the program and make up their their own opinion about what they hear me me say, Casper say, the guests say. They take all that in and they go, all right, this is what I think. I don't like it when people go, all right, you must think what I must think. I think that's a real problem in media these days. Yeah, to use an analogy, it's similar to like a movie sometimes, especially ones which have an open ending. Sometimes it's left to Mm. the viewer to decide, you know, what has actually happened. And I think that's a good thing about submission radio. I mean, staying neutral allows, you know, the listener to come up with their own opinion on, you know, a certain fighter, like a John Jones, like a Frank Mir. Um, And, you know, on that note, so you guys have travelled overseas. You know, I've seen videos where, um, you know, you've interviewed fighters, you know, both before and after their fights. Uh, The Nate Diaz and Conor McGregor one uh, stood out as well. Um, what's it like, you know, traveling to Las Vegas and, you know, interviewing, you know, all these fighters? I'd imagine it's, you know, a really big thrill. Mm. Yeah, when we went up there the first time for UFC 200, and that was our first overseas international uh, event that we covered, it was pretty crazy because it was a few events in a few days. Yeah. And we were used to doing local stuff like here in Australia. The Melbourne show was huge with Ronda Rousey, for example, but... We sort of jumped right off into the deep end right away when we went overseas, and that was like that was a wild experience. I wouldn't have it any other way. And um, it, you know, it was just surreal. It's like you're in a movie. You go through Las Vegas. You you, you see all these iconic venues like the MGM. You, you see all these crazy things. Like me and Casper, we love the show Las Vegas. So we're going through hotels, <laughs> looking at things, like having a good time. Um, so yeah, it's it's just an amazing opportunity. Uh, I, like I think for me personally. Jonathan, it's one of those things where balancing it out, having fun, you know, make sure you enjoy the journey, not just the destination. Make the most out of out of your trip. Make the most out of your experiences. Like me and Casper, we like to go out. We like to hang out with other media members. We like to have fun. We like to have laughs. We like to have drinks. But when it comes down to the actual event, it's a little bit like uh, for, for the Australian people listening right now, if you're playing in a football team and there's that little – sort of smell before you start playing. There's that feeling in the air of tension. You're not competing really with the other media members. In a lot of ways, you're competing with mm-hmm. yourself. You're like, I want to get the most out of this opportunity. I want to ask the right questions. And it's like so, sort of getting used to that feeling because that can sort of be debilitating if you think about it too much. But if you don't think about it enough, then you're not prepared. It's like finding a crazy... It's all mental, man. Mm-hmm. So that, that's probably one of the more interesting things I could take away from it. Yeah, it's almost... I think the, yeah. something, sorry to, to cut in, Jonathan. No, that's fine. Something that you touched on, Dennis, uh, that's interesting and uh, that I was kind of shocked by when we first started doing this and then we sort of went into the international shows is that the media, they're not really cutthroat and they're not really all that competitive. Obviously, they are in certain ways, but it's more behind the scenes. It's more about the work they produce. But when you go to an event, you have these 
massive outlets like MMA Fighting, MMA Junkie, and, and all these huge outlets that you know anyone as an MMA fan knows. Um, we we sort of initially thought that it would be you know pulling plugs out of laptops and disconnecting cameras <laughs> and stuff like that. It's really the, the complete opposite. You go there and they're, they're helping you and they're telling you, hey, set up here. This is where you're going to get the best angle and do this. This is who's coming out. There's a very strong sense of sort of camaraderie, even though we're all competing against each other. So that's something that surprised me. And I think the other thing about these international shows, which is what makes it our favorite, is because, is that here in Australia, we're somewhat limited in terms of resources. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a lot of great MMA fighters here, um, but when you're covering MMA on an international stage, you know, like we're, we're sort of limited. Like the, 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 the MMA fighters from Australia that are in the UFC, there's so much fewer than when you go to, say, a UFC 205 in New York. You just have an abundance of, of massive fighters and massive stars, and there's so many to interview. There's, there's so many, I guess, contacts that we've built throughout the years that it's a real thrill to finally be able to go. And not just, it's, it's not about meeting them in person, it's the fact that now we can do a video interview. Now, if something happens, you know, we're not thousands of kilometers on the other side of the world. We can say, hey, let's do an interview, and then we do, and then, you know, we cover things on the spot. So th those days when we go sort of, cover an international event it's it's very 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 crazy times mm. there is very little time slept and uh you know it's very seldom to find like fun times fun things to do um there's a lot of work but it's it's, it's uh yeah it, it's amazing yeah because i could imagine going to ufc 200 you know for the first time like it for an overseas you know event and a lot mm. of things happen there uh we had mm. john jones um so he failed a drug test and Daniel Cormier, Anderson Silva had to come in, and it was a very weird situation. Uh, so I remember stories of, you know, media outlets, you know, having to, you know, cover lots of things. Did, did you find that period of time quite frenetic? I mean, it's quite a, it's quite a unique way to be introduced to, you know, overseas media, per se. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's pretty, it's pretty frantic, but... Me and Casper, when we go there, it's like a huge hustle, right? And we just want to hustle, 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 and get the most out of it for our listeners, the fans. We, we really feel like we want to deliver the best coverage possible. So when things like John Jones happening, and for example, we find ourselves in the room when John Jones announces he's off the card. Mm. I mean, heartbreaking, right? But at the same time, you want to have a story to tell from an event. Like, if we do a local fight night card from Brisbane, a UFC one, for example... There's not as many uh, things to focus on. It's not as much fun. You really have to dig deep to get those topics out, the stories out. You really have to research to get people to care about it. But over with the UFC 200, you had Brock Lesnar, you had Mark Hunt, you had that story. Then you had uh, Anderson Silva is now fighting Daniel Cormier. What's going to happen with John Jones and everything else mm. with the surrounding events? It was like a buffet for us. We were going around, <laughs> dishing out these stories. People were super interested in them. We could do up post uh, our breakdowns where we jump on camera spoke about it to us to me and to us i mean that's a dream come true we like things happening like that mm -hmm. mm. yeah dennis is right about how many things there were to cover i mean there was a joke even amongst like ufc staff like pr people like dave Scholler, where they would joke about how just do the ridiculous amount of things there were to cover like after ufc 200 I think all the media was were just dead. They were so drained. And then Dave Scholler was it. They had the post fight press conference, and he said, "All right, guys, one more surprise uh, press conference." Everyone was kind of like, "What?" And he said, "Just kidding, just kidding." And everybody understood that joke because of how many surprise press conferences were that week. To put it in perspective, if you take a, if you take any event like a one ninety three or, or a fight night Melbourne or what have you, there's four days where you cover things. There's a media day. There's a workout day. There are um, the weigh-ins, and then there's the event. So it's kind of like one big thing every day. With UFC 200 and International Fight Week, you had three events. Yeah. So you would have one day where you would you would wake up early, um, there'd be open workouts. Then you would rush to a media day for another event. Then you would have weigh-ins for another event. Then there'd be a press conference. Then there'd be the actual event itself, and then there'd be another press conference afterwards. And that was like three or four days straight, so... Yeah, that, that that was that was insane. That was an experience of a lifetime, and and thus far, nothing's compared to it. Not two hundred two, not two hundred five. They've both been busy events, but not like UFC two hundred uh, fight week. Yeah, because I mean, even in um, that sense, like I think UFC two hundred two was the rematch between Nate Diaz and Conor McGregor, and that was a huge mm -hmm. event itself. But obviously, during that period of time, Conor McGregor wanted less 
uh, media obligations. So Nate Diaz took up a lot of those media opportunities as a way to promote the fight. Uh, one of the fascinating things I find about UFC, one of the most interesting things, is that uh, the media coverage I often find is just as exciting as the fights themselves. Mm-hmm. The reasons why is because with two fighters, um, especially at the UFC, there's a certain amount of ego and confidence you need as a fighter to succeed. And sometimes you see that when you're interviewing fighters, say, sometimes you can really notice you know, what their mental... Uh, frame is before they head into a fight and i think you know a lot of the fight is a mental game as opposed to physical Uh, a lot of the fighters are physically gifted anyway and this is why i mean if you're if you're kind of like a a betting person you'd want to study the interviews what you'd want to see which fighter looks the most uh confident um i think you can tell a lot before a fight in that regard um have you ever had you know like situations where a fighter came across as um overly confident and paid the consequences consequences for it later i mean one that springs to mind is he's a great fighter though a superb fighter is luke rockhold um Mm -hmm, against mm -hmm. michael bisbing and i i certainly thought Luke Rockhold would win that, but he seemed, um, it's okay to be confident, but he seemed too confident. I think he said he had no nerves before the fight. He just kind of, you know, walked in and expected to win because he already beat Bisbing before. Um, mm. do, you, do, you, do you find those situations where, like, as a media member, you're kind of analysing the mindsets of the fighters before the f- fight matchup begins? Yeah, yeah, you absolutely do. But then at the same time, I've been in situations where I thought, oh, this guy doesn't look right, and then he looks good on fight day. Yeah. So it's one of those things where you've you got to be careful. You can't read too much into it, but I think you owe it to the people to sort of explain, oh, hey, I noticed this and this and this, or maybe it means this and that. Like, I will say, um, when uh, Mark Hunt fought Stipe over in Adelaide, for example, uh, like we, we saw that Mark Hunt was struggling to lose weight. Mm. Like we, we knew about the fact that Mark Hunt you know, it doesn't sometimes has these instances where he, where he doesn't train as hard um, in between camps and his weight can, you know, sort of go overboard. But really, like, that, that weight cut, him trying to lose the weight, trying to get in there, and, and it really affected the fight more than people realize. And, now, me and Cash were there during the way, and we saw, like, when he lifted up his shirt, he was trying to um, do some water cutting, I believe, and a b- bunch of other stuff, which was crazy to us to make the heavyweight division. Yeah, so there was already a few quick question marks in our head about that. And you get some other guys um, who are overly confident during the fight, like Alistair Overing. He lost a couple of fights because of that. We saw what happened with Travis Brown and Bigfoot Silver. Yeah. But um, it's one of those things, you know, some, sometimes guys are o- overly confident. It's a part of their mental game, and they come in and they do it. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's really hard beforehand. For me, it's more the weight cut. If I see it's a tough weight cut, if I see this guy struggling – make the weight, I go, okay, this will definitely have some kind of factor on him in the fight. Because you, can, you can't say it won't. Everybody's human. It's a human side of fighting. Yeah. When it comes to this guy's overly confident, I'm like, yeah, all right, this guy is overly confident. Maybe it will affect the fight. But then a part of me is like, maybe this is a part of his mental game. Maybe this is mm. what his mental coach uh, and him worked on. Maybe this is how he gets the best out of him. Like, for example, for me, I know when I, when I play sport, I gotta, if I want to do well, I've got to tell myself, look, you know, you can do this, you can beat this guy, yeah. go out there, do your best. Like, personally, that's what makes what makes me better when I play sport. Well, I've got guys that I'm friends with, that i played sport before, that have to be very humble and be like, all right, just be careful. Like, not, not do the opposite approach. So everybody mm. works differently mentally. So, it's, I don't know, it's just really tough until after the fight to look back on that. And it's really easy after the fight to be like, oh, hey, sort of connect the dots a little bit. Yeah. But then, mm. but then you know... It's sort of armchair quarterbacking in a lot of ways sometimes, too, where you're like, you get a lot of people like, oh, yeah, see, I told you this is what happened. It's like, no, you didn't. <laughs> you didn't say anything before, before the fight happened. Or like, you know, there's a lot of uh, fights that happen, and you like, oh, like, for example, if you if you pick Michael Bisping to beat Luke Rockhold, people are like, you're, a, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. And then everyone's like, oh, I, I thought Bisping had, it was going to beat uh, Luke Rockhold. So it's like, 
a lot of that going on in MMA, but it's certainly tough to gauge from a mental perspective before the fight. Yeah, I, mean, I think I think that a lot of times, like on our show, we'll try and sort of break down and analyze fights after the fact as opposed to beforehand because there, there's so many factors, and a lot of times we just want to see the fight. But I find that a lot of times um, the, the sort of demeanor of the fighters to me almost matters the least because you see, for example, Ronda Rousey against Holly Holm. When she came in there, she seemed flustered, she seemed aggravated, and you thought, oh, okay, well, you know, Ronda might be in trouble, and she was. And Bas Rutten was on the show recently talking about how, you know, she needs to get rid of that anger. Yeah. Then you've got someone like Tito Ortiz who says, you know, if I'm not emotional, and then Bas Rutten was saying, you know, being emotional in a fight is just never going to help you. Tito Ortiz, who just beat Chel Sonnen, and he's saying if he's not emotional, um, he doesn't fight well. He, he doesn't yeah. get good results. And I think that's why you saw Tito always having this constant, um, you know, depth there towards Chael Sonnen and, and, and just always, you know, locking eyes with him. And sometimes it just seems foolish. But I think what Tito was trying to do was hype himself up. Then yeah. you got another perfect example at UFC 202 where Conor McGregor looked like he was insane. He looked like he, he fell off the wagon. And he looked like a man who knew he was defeated um, to Nate Diaz. It just looked like the pressure had gotten to him. And uh, we saw the Waynes where he went mm-hmm. crazy and we did predictions afterwards. We all said, dude, Conor McGregor doesn't have a way to win this. Yeah. Of course, he goes out there and he wins this. And according to Coach John Kavanagh, after that weigh-in, McGregor said something to the the effect of, all right, the illusion of insanity yes. is now over. Yes. So there's so much gamesmanship, and you don't really know who's playing games, who's not playing games, and who's just doing it to get the best performance out of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's almost like a game of mental warship, you know, before, mm. before and during the fight. Um, you mentioned Tito Ortiz. He's kind of like a... I mean, obviously, he departed successfully from the sport, having defeated Chael Sonnen. Um, mm-hmm. he, he's kind of a contrary to the saying, um, don't fight out of anger. And mm-hmm. some fighters can fight with anger, but some can't. And Tito Ortiz is definitely one that has succeeded in that field. Um, so, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I really appreciate it. I have a lot of respect for your work at Submission Radio. And uh, I'll leave you to it because I think you guys are probably in the midst of interviewing different fighters. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you very much, Johnson. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, just as a last thing, to any journalist, uh, people in the journalistic uh, classes, anyone looking to become a journalist, anyone looking to be part of MMA media, the only advice I can give you is just go do it. You know, don't don't just uh, sit around, think about it. Don't don't talk yourself out of it. If you really want to do it, if you really want to cover the sport of MMA, contact people with a website. Get in there, write your articles, try to get you to your events, and just you know try and live your dream. 